Father, we praise you and thank you for your wonderful word. Your word indeed is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask the God that you continue, Lord, to reveal your word to our lives. And even now, Lord, let the energy that comes from the power of your word enlighten us. The word of God from your spirit, spoken, O God, into this inspired, written word of yours. Written by the inspiration of the Spirit And that is kept down through the ages Until our time Still full of the Holy Spirit's power That once breathed into these words We ask the Lord for the spirit of wisdom and revelation To fall afresh upon our spirits Grant that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened That we may know the hope of your calling The riches of your inheritance in the saints and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. Thank you for your word, O Father. Thank you for your spirit. And we ask, O God, that your word will be like a fire in our bones. Your word would be the bread of life to our spirits and then to our souls, and even to our physical body. For your word says that your word can become flesh, O God, giving us spiritual life upon this mortal body of ours. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you for your glory and all your grace that you have shown unto us. And we ask that tonight, once again, you will show your glory to us in your word. Show us a glimpse of your glorious church in this book of Acts that we study. That somewhere in our hearts, you will birth a vision of what the church can be in you. And what Christianity can be in its fullness, O God. O Father, when we look at church history for the past 2,000 years, and compared to the book of Acts, we know how far away we have strayed from your word. And in these end times and in these last days, we know, Lord, that the last day church shall be even more powerful and glorious than the former church, Lord. And all that is done will be magnified and multiplied in this end time church. We ask that you may raise once again your modern apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. And that you will send them forth to revive and bring a revival that that caused the glorious church to rise forth. A church without spot or wrinkle. A church endued, empowered and filled with the fullness of God. To that end, O God, we live our Christian life. For this purpose, O Lord, we continue to live for you each day of our lives. We have consecrated our lives unto you, Lord, that through our life Jesus may be glorified. And as your word is preached and shared, stretch off your hand, O God, and grant that signs and wonders may be accomplished in each one of our lives. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. As we mentioned, the book of Acts is 28 chapters. And uh, it's divided from chapter 1 to chapter 12 And then uh, which talks about the Jerusalem church And in chapter 13 onwards to 28 It talks about the Antioch church and the four missionary regions of Paul With the last ending in Rome where Acts 28 ends And uh, during the time of Acts there's also a transition From the Jewish church to the Gentile church The church started primarily as a Jewish church in Acts chapter uh, 1 and 2 by the time Acts 28 ends, and it's like an open-ended ending showing us that the story continues in our modern church, that uh, it was primarily a Gentile church. We have touched on how in the first 12 chapters, they are hidden inside these, uh, their truths about uh, things that we can do with our modern church, that we can apply to our modern church. And we show for how in the first six chapters, that uh, hidden within it are what we are called uh, five different phases or types of revival that a church can have. And, uh, and so for a slight revision, we give you some notes uh, on chapter 1 to 6 before we go to on chapter 7 to 12 tonight. And, uh, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, maybe a bit more lights, I don't mind. Yep, thank you. Okay. So, uh, chapter 1 to 6 cover the five phases of possible church growth or uh, you can replace the word with revival also. And up to today, uh, we have seen 
possibly just glimpses of some of them to a certain extent. And uh, in Acts chapter 2, we see the... And these are five places in the book of Acts. In the first six chapters, there are five places that talk about church growth. So we identify where the verses are, and exactly at where the verses are, we found that the causes of the growth were slightly different in each of the five cases. That's how we get all the five cases out. And uh, there's no more except five. Five is the number of grace. And no more, no less. And these are the exact five places we talk about church growing. Either it says the Lord added to the church, uh, or, or daily they were added to the church, or in Acts 6, they multiplied. So these are the verses. Uh, in, in the first case, we saw in Acts chapter 1 to 2, that uh, there was no miracles yet, but there was definitely the power of the Holy Spirit. There was at least one sign, the sign of, um, of tongues, and uh, no one was healed yet in Acts 2 up to that point. And in fact, they thought that the, the church people were drunken at first. And they were asking questions, how can they speak these unknown languages? And it was through the, what we call the power of the Holy Spirit, preaching, teaching, and signs that brought the first 3,000 souls into the church. We have mentioned the background by which 3,000 souls were saved in the teaching. But what we want to find is, within these five points, if you want to do further research in the book of Acts about revival, it's said that people, when they study revival, they don't study revival in the first six chapters. They're going to study revival all over in 2,000 years of church history, uh, failing to study revival in the book of Acts. And I'm a student of revival, I read all revival books, and I'm interested in church revival to the standard of the book of Acts. And uh, in the first type of revival, it's like through the power of the Holy Spirit still, there could be some signs, like the then tongues, and, uh, but primarily the, there was a power of preaching of the word. And it can come forth to teaching too. That causes church growth, revival, and people getting back into God. Immediately after that, you see the second type of growth. After 3,000 years, 3,000 souls were saved. They have small groups. They meet from home, house to house, and they were also meeting in a temple. So we know they meet in a big gathering and in small groups. And they tell us what they did in small groups, uh, including taking care of one another. And so within this uh, second type of uh, revival and church growth, you, we find a lot of the modern church growth today. Like when you talk about cell groups or, or home fellowships and all those things, they are found in this uh, second category or second type of church growth revival. And uh, uh, they produce church growth. And then we have, of course, the, it grew to 5,000 men uh, after the healing of the layman on the way to the, to the temple. That's in Acts chapter 3. And that impact continued right on to chapter 4. So in chapter 3 and 4, we found the one healing, just one healing of the lame man, there was an extra 2,000 people added, 2,000 men. They, you see, he mentioned men, so he didn't count the women. Could be more than that, added to the church. That is, uh, through signs, wonders, healings, miracles, church growth also take place. And uh, in, in your country of Singapore, you have uh, uh, today, uh, based on today's, uh, uh, today's uh, uh, model, today, 2011, uh, some of your churches have grown and, and grown big because of these first two reasons. Either in the church they have good preaching uh, or, or teaching to a certain extent, and small groups, and to some extent, some healing, some miracles here and there. And that has caused your church grow. But in Singapore, you do not have number four and five yet the type of revival that has come. In Indonesia, they have. In Indonesia, they have a presence of God demonstrated uh, one time in the, in the 1970s revival in Soe, which is written in the book, Like a Mighty Wind by Mount Tari and the Gentle Breeze of Jesus by Mount Tari. Plus, there are a lot of church history that study the 1960s revival that took place in Indonesia. They have a measure of the presence of God demonstrated there, where God just came down. And something took place. Some people saw fire on the roof, and uh, when they uh, went into that kind of present, it was it was tremendous. And uh, so they have a measure of that that presence of God there, a measure not to the full extent like Acts five, where it was even so powerful that the shadow of Peter passing by could heal the people, and not to that extent, but a certain measure. And and uh, I, so far, 
uh, the presence of God is always everywhere, I understand. But there, are, there is a manifest presence of God. Uh, we haven't come across where uh, a church in Singapore grow because everyone say the presence of God is there. They grow, either people say, hey, there's good teaching there, there's good preaching there. All their fantastic ministry within the small groups and it multiply. The church people's needs are taken care of. And healings to a certain extent here and there. And, uh, but uh, you haven't come across where the presence of God uh, was demonstrated. That's in uh, Indonesia, it's happened. In uh, East Malaysia, it has happened among the tribal people. And the presence of God has come down upon the people, entire tribal groups and villages in, the, in East Malaysia uh, has happened. Now, West Malaysia is like uh, Singapore. We have only seen probably some level of that and some level of the power of preaching, some level, some miracles, some small groups. And a lot of the churches, they continue to grow. Uh, uh, long ago, about uh, probably 15 years ago or so, in the early charismatic revival, there were very few good preachers and teachers from Asia themselves. So we had to import a lot of preachers and the only class we could get were when foreigners come and preach. Uh, if you all remember, long ago, 15, 20 years ago. But praise God, today God has raised a lot of Asians and a lot of them are writing books, they're teaching, preaching. So uh, they have a good ministry that God has risen. And uh, so it's a matter of time, as you know, in each place, each country. And uh, at the moment, uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, first three types uh, are seen. But very rare do we see the fourth type of revival, uh, church growth that came by the presence of God. It says that when uh, Ananias and Sapphira dropped, dropped down and died, uh, people were frightened of the presence of God. They realized the presence of God was indeed in that place. You can't even tell a simple lie. You drop dead. And... Uh, after that, people were so frightened to join them, but yet there were still people joining them. There were still, it says, that God still added to the church, and the people still joining them because they really loved the Lord, and they loved the presence of God that was there. Not only that, for the first time, you see people from all the surrounding region bringing their sick, as if it was Jesus. It was Jesus once again, walking along the street, but this time it was the apostles. They were there. <clears throat> Then we saw in uh, number 5, another church group which took place in Acts chapter 6. And this church group was totally different. And uh, the church had grown and grown and grown. And all the ministry depended on the apostles a lot. So that the apostles themselves said in Acts chapter 6 at the beginning, that they cannot take care of the widows uh, that were there. And, uh, and, uh, and all the responsibility was them. So that was the first time in Acts 6, they appointed seven deacons. And out of the seven deacons, we know that one of them was, uh, was Stephen and one of them uh, uh, was, uh, was stoned to death. And uh, then we know that Philip, the other deacon, grew to become an evangelist. And so in the Bible, you have uh, apostles. You have uh, among the twelve apostles like uh, uh, John and uh, Peter. You have Paul who was a five-foot apostle. And then you have prophets like Agabus who, who, who rose up in Acts 11. You have evangelists. Philip was called the evangelist in Acts 21. And then you have uh, pastors and teachers, prophets and teachers. You mentioned Acts 13 was 1 to 3. It says there were prophets and teachers in the church. And we know Paul was among those teachers. And possibly he was a prophet till he grew into the apostle. And... Um, then you have good pastors and leaders in the church, people like Aquila and Priscilla. You hear them later in the book of Acts 18 and the book of Acts 19. And uh, they were all involved in the work of God, uh, Aquila and Priscilla. They function like good pastors. So you could actually name some of the fivefold ministries and they're given to us as examples so that the book of Acts uh, is a place where we can pattern the modern church. Now, within each of these places, there, is, there are principles and points. And I believe that hidden in Acts chapter 5 are, are keys how to bring a revival in that section. For example, if I'm interested in church growth based on small groups, then I look at Acts 2, 42 to 47. Although there are only about six verses there, if you study them daily, you find each of the principles that are recorded. And, uh, and, and it can be implemented with the Spirit and you can see the kind of growth. So the presence of God is mentioned and as we mentioned in Acts 5, one of the things that took place was the tremendous love of God that was demonstrated. The people were so sacrificial. In Acts 4 and Acts 5, you notice that they, they were helping one another so much that there was no poor person in the church. Think about how much love was demonstrated. So with, with great love uh, came the presence of God that was also there. 
And, and that is why many people, when they try to get into this level of, of the power of God to pronounce judgment, it doesn't happen because there's not enough love there. So there is a correlation and principle behind each of those that tell us the core reasons why those things move. And in uh, number five, church growth, which is Acts chapter six, they came to the appointment of the, of the seven deacons. And uh, the seven deacons, some of, them, uh, uh, grew, uh, some of them continued to grow into other ministries. It was just a starting point for their ministry. And uh, let's look at the book of Acts chapter 6, <coughs> where we left off and complete this section here. In Acts 6, we are told that, uh, that there were principles behind how they find uh, these uh, seven deacons. You notice that these people would already be active in the church. And uh, the other place that we realize is, in chapter 6 verse 1, it started as bad news. If you stop at Acts 6 verse 1, it looked like bad news because they are having church problem. But it's a good problem because there were more people to minister to and not enough people ministering to them. It's a good problem and they have a good solution for that. Uh, and, uh, so... Uh, when the church grow in the book of Acts, they have church problems. Yes, they have church problems. They even have some church quarrels. You see, in Acts chapter, chapter 11, Peter was um, confronted for going to, to Cornelius' house because they were all Jewish people. And then in Acts 15, they argue about doctrinal issues. And Acts 13, some people went to the Antioch church and tried to convert some of the Gentiles to Jews. And uh, then in Acts chapter 15, right at the ending there, yeah, Paul and Barnabas who worked together for so long uh, in a first missionary journey. Suddenly, they have, to, they have disagreement over one guy called Mark and then they separated ways. So it was not a perfect church. But yet, it was a powerful church. And there are many principles that we can learn in the book of Acts. So here in Acts 6, it was not a perfect church. They, they were growing and there were growing pains that were involved. They found a solution and uh, they sought out seven men of good reputation. But it's not just good reputation. Now these people, seek out people of good reputation, full stop. They have to, good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. And wisdom. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, some people try to seek out people with good reputation, full stop. Uh, they forgot that some of those people who are fantastic are in the world. You see, it doesn't mean that if you are a fantastic teacher in a secular school, you can become a teacher in the Word of God. Two different ball games. It doesn't mean that if you're a fantastic organizer out in the business world, you can come to the church and apply all the, the, the administration things you learn from the secular world. No, because a business is run like a business. Church is run a different style. Everyone has equal rights. It's much more closer to where everyone has equal rights than in the business where the people that, are, that you're organizing, you might have 20,000 employees under you. But there's one big fact. All the 20,000 are depending on you to feed them. Of course they will listen to you. They don't like you, they still listen to you. And, uh, but it's not so in the church where you're encouraging uh, volunteerism. You know, people are volunteering and giving themselves freely to serve God. You sometimes cannot apply the same business principles and run a church like a business. Because although, although a church should be run properly to the best business principle so that it's not like making loose laws or losing money or, 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 or when, when they do anything that uh, you know, they're getting more and more and more and more into debt, that should not be. So there's a basic common sense business principles. Yet at the same time, you cannot take business principle, lock, stock, barrier, apply it to, to the Christian Bible principle, which is why the Bible says there's such a thing as a gift of administration, which is separate from a secular ability. And it's found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Towards the ending there, it talks about various gifts, including the gift of administration. There is a, all these are Holy Spirit. So it's not so much good reputation alone. You have to be good rep reputation, but full of the Holy Spirit. And so I believe if you want to look for good church leaders in any place, the place you probably look for them is in the prayer meetings. Why? If they are prayerful people, then obviously they're going to be good leaders. However, not all prayerful people make good leaders because they might be only strong in prayer and nothing else. But if, if a person really loves the Lord, then they would 
uh, seek to have more time and spend more time with the Lord. And thus, uh, prayerful people are very valuable, especially if you have leaders who are also prayerful. And there we have it, they're full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Because these are all the points and there are several points that you go. Uh, each of these uh, principles got many, many points under each. And we can only touch on some of them and highlight some of them and realize that you have to go deeper because this is like an like a, a, a entire book panorama. So we are covering 28 chapters, maybe in 4-5 or five weeks. And so we, we take big chunks of chapter to cover the overall and leaving you pointers to study further. And uh, I would say, Every pastor who plants a church, every missionary who plants missionary church should study this until they could know it at the back of their hands. They, uh, because it is what we need to study. The sad thing that I found, I've been to seminary for three years. Then after that, I've gone on to uh, take courses in, uh, in uh, Christian counseling, uh, then in theology and all those other things. You know, the saddest thing is they study everything under the sun and the Bible that came through. When the Bible is supposed to be the source, and sometimes I remember when you learn theology, you learn Karl Barth, you learn uh, uh, Immanuel Kant, and all those things, but we don't look into the Bible for theology. We look at all these big thinkers, although, you know, uh, no harm done, I mean, these are very good people too, and uh, good Christian theologians, but forgot to study the Bible. What say of the Bible? We forgot. And we study everything under the sun except the Bible. So, when you study church, you study everything under the sun except the Bible. When you study uh, Christian living, you study everything under the sun except the Bible. And um, so, that's sad. And uh, when we should assume that the Bible is the only place that we can actually get the true truth of everything. You know why? Because if I were a, a, a church, let's say, in Korea, and, uh, and I built a large church uh, in Korea, let's say, where the people are quite homogeneous, and uh, cell groups and everything. When I come and teach you church growth, I will only teach you based on my church. So you only learn one aspect. But you could go to America, today the largest church is Joel Osteen's church. I can tell you, the cell group system is very poor. I mean, every church should got cell group system. But their church didn't grow because of cell group. Their church grew because of the type of preaching that that they like the kind of preaching that Joel offered. And uh, I know jo John Austin's church. I've been to the church even when John Austin, Joel's father, was there. Stayed there for six weeks trying to learn under him. And it was not based on a cell group church. They were trying to build a church based on uh, preaching and teaching at a certain level that they were. And then some of you might say, what kind of church are we seeking to build? Well, Everything here. <laughs> but the hardest, I believe, is number six here. Number five. Because I believe that, that in a church, everyone should find something to do for the Lord. How to bring that about, I'm not 100% there yet. Because uh, we, we have only done a little bit here and there. And uh, in, in Malaysia, we had about 1,000 people uh, before we left. So in our Sunday services, we, we lasted from 10, 10 a.m. Our worship lasted uh, until about uh, uh, 12 or 1, and then the preaching started. So some people, by the time most, where most churches, people are going out, we're just starting the message. <laughs> and so then that was, and then by the time we finished, it was 2 or 3, and because we were trying to accommodate, because in the church, we also have, we have microphones for people to come and prophesy in the church. And that might not be applicable in Singapore. And we had to find ways of, of finding where, where everyone finds their place in the ministry. There's the fivefold, but there are the ministries in the church. Like for example, we ask, you know, what is your gift? After all, everyone has a gift in a lot. You have at least one gift minimum. You might have more than one gift. And then the second question is, if you have found your gift, do you have a place to function in a church? Our desire is, by the grace of God, if we can, we can build a church where everyone can function in their gift. Uh, and, so, and it looks nice. As usual, everything on paper looks nice. But why it's not on paper is this that I find difficult. The egos of people we give. Sometimes the gift more anointed, their ego bigger. 
and uh, no, like they got the take over the church kind of mentality, or take over the world. Which is why most mega churches don't even let you function. You know why? The moment you try to come out, they knock you back down. Right? In case you take over the church. And uh, so they are very insecure. But they were not insecure in the book of Acts. When they anointed people, these people grew in ministry. They, they, uh, they, Peter got jealous when Stephen started preaching fantastically. Did uh, uh, any of the apostles get jealous when Philip could go to an entire new town and evangelize the town? No, I don't think so. In fact, they did follow up after Philip. Which was fantastic. They were still working together. Nobody was insecure. Nobody was jealous. And, uh, and then the other thing I found, to, to do that, one needs to also know about all the gifts. You ask the average pastor about speaking in tongues, say, what tongues? He talk about tongues praying for five hours, the pastor instead only pray for 15 minutes, so how can he lead you? And uh, they talk about gifts of healing, the pastor might not even know what the gifts of healing are. Talk about discerning as well, they might not. So how can you guide another person if you don't experience the same thing? You cannot learn these sort of things in theory. So that's another secondary reason why uh, people are not guided. And uh, not to say one person must have every gift, but you must have the ability to recognize where it's a good gift. And then be willing to give a place for that. And from time to time, we find gifts, you know, many times we find gifts that are there, but still rough edge, need a lot of polishing. And uh, a lot of sharp edge, you know, when people are sharp edge, spiritually they look like a porcupine. Go near them, you get hurt. To them, they say, hey, why, uh? why, uh? why, uh? why, I'm not hurt. You know, of course not, because all the pine needles are pointed outwards. <laughs> So the more they hug you, the more you pain. <laughs> and, uh, so there's a, a, a balance for that. But when they are good gifts, it's good to release them. Let them find a place and then go from there. And, uh, so we, we, we seek to do that. And we're going to take time to do it. Five-fold ministries is still within our vision. And we love to see it come to, come to be. But uh, I make one mistake as I started coming back to the ministry is that I should have built a stronger platform before allow all the five folds to jump in. Because uh, uh, we succeeded in raising a lot of five folds, one in Malaysia, when we built a church about a thousand strong. Oh, wow. And uh, then I realized that I only started helping the five folds after our church was big. And uh, if there's anyone going to shake me, it's me shake myself, nobody shakes me off the place. And um, then uh, we raised a lot of five folds. Uh, a lot of five folds, we released them, opened doors for them. And then in some of those places, because in those days, <coughs> we could go, go to a new place and have a convention. And then uh, some of the fivefold that we raised, and I'm confident of them by that time. And they have never had opportunity to preach before. And uh, <coughs> I remember in, even in, in Singapore, as, uh, we were invited to preach right together with Dina Karen. <coughs> and uh, they're talking about talking an audience of thousands of people. And so those people had never preached a big audience before, but we sometimes introduce them. And so instead of me going, I say, look, let me send my second man. Say, he is that good. And so they would go there, and for the first time they preach to those people, they function in the givers, people see the gifts, then their ministry takes off, take off. So it can have a very good effect and impact. And uh, so uh, my mistake, I realized that as in this time around, is I need to build a strong, stronger base first. Because I find that the more effective a person is at a gift, sometimes the more egoistic they are. And uh, so big egos are very hard to deal with. And you sometimes got to correct them, you know. And they correct them, they don't like, they want to punch back. <laughs> and uh, so they punch back, hey, you know, I'm a prophet too. Oh, yeah, 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 I read the book, prophet. <laughs> so is your name Agabus? <laughs> right? Okay. Anyway, some of them, their name actually Agabus. <laughs> Right, and uh, so uh, all with big egos, and and uh, and it's very hard. Look at look at the modern church in Singapore today. You know, you got local fivefold ministries, and uh, possibly I'm not sure of anyone in Singapore with a strong prophetic gift. You got good pastors, and you know some are apostolic in their thing, and then uh, uh, some of them are, are evangelists who founded the church is based on healing. Uh, fantastic! In the early days, when I see all these ministries coming out, it's heartened. But here's another question. Will they ever work together? Sometimes they try. They try as long as the the uh, I'm trying to find the Chinese word. The taiko uh, remains the taiko. Everyone is smaller. Taiko means big brother, right? 
Okay, I got the right word. And so, you know, so when, when, when two big brothers come, wah, like, you cannot have more than one red Indian chief. Fight. Ah! So instead of the five foe joining together to win the whole of Singapore, sometimes you got a five foe quarreling. And of course, that doesn't do good for the church at all. It's funny why churches should quarrel. Very funny. Why should we? We are serving the same Lord Jesus, correct? Right? Unless, you know, unless. Uh, no church is the same. They've got slightly different ways of doing things, slightly different interpretations of the Bible. As long as they preach Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and they're bringing people to win souls, say, that's good, you know, it's good. Let them do their job. Let them do their job. Let you do your job. Everyone do their job. And from time to time, gather together in the Lord and seek to work together. One of the f- hardest things I find is to get fivefold to work side by side. We almost succeeded at the peak of our ministry before we left Asia in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s. Because I could travel and I could bring all the fivefold and say, okay, you guys come. And then I could go to a convention and say, look, these are all the fivefold. Let them minister in a meeting too. It's wonderful when you can get all the fivefold working together. But today, sometimes you've got a big convention. Oh, there's only one, one of these guys there. That convention, only the prophetic. This convention, only that. And everything is all, also isolated. And so to attend 5-4, you've got to attend five times. <laughs> right? And, uh, and then some churches, they might bring a lot of speakers, but all the speakers are the same. All are basically either pastors or all, all or church planters. And then, and then you cannot learn prophetic things out there. You've got to learn, go somewhere to learn. And, um, but in the Bible, it shows forth that in number five, when the anointed people are placed in the right place, in the right structure, they blossom. Which is what I believe. And I believe the, the ideal church uh, is very dynamic. It might not be perfect. You know, people still have egos and, uh, and they just need to find their place. You need to have the right coordinator. And uh, in the early days, sometimes God has to raise our whole coordinator, which I feel that my role is sometimes coordinating people in a fivefold. And, uh, and like Gordon Lindsay, in the early days of the ministry, when the 1950s revival was hitting the United States, just prior to the, to the charismatic revival in the 1960s, there were a lot of fivefold that got raised. And it was Gordon Lindsay who has a ministry called The Voice of Healing. He gathered a group of these people and they worked together. And they brought revival here and there in the United States at that time. And, and they managed to bring them together. And part of the spirit continued in Higgins' ministry in the early days, not the later. In the early days, uh, I remember how they would go to a, have a convention and then they have all the different five folks represented uh, to minister to the crowd. And the re- anointing was usually quite powerful. And you hear my teaching on revival, there are three types of revival. And it's a revival that is produced out of normal church growth which can be caused in any, anything. There's a revival that is produced by the fivefold. So a good fivefold can go to a place and bring revival. But then there's category one, category two, category three revival. Category three revival is where the presence of God starts manifesting. And the fivefold are still there, but in the background. The other people are still there, but all in the background. God takes precedence, and the presence of God uh, creates a fantastic revival that you cannot replace or duplicate. And because God just shows up and there's a revival. So, number six, uh, number, num- uh, chapter six, uh, which is number five in our church growth type of uh, phase that the Bible shows, uh, is to find the people, get the right people <coughs> into the right place. And everything is timing. Sometimes a person is gifted, but they need training because too many rough ages. Sometimes a person has a gift but undeveloped, so they also need time to learn and function in the gifts. And, uh, and, and before they get into the place where God wants them to do. Uh, they're still within the vision that I believe needs to happen. And, uh, and it needs to happen in order to have the kind of church that Jesus wants. Because if you're a new Bible student or you're interested in the ministry or you're a young Christian coming up, you wonder in your mind, what is the ideal church? Now, the ideal church is not necessarily the church that you got born again that you stuck to for 30 years. Because 
I, when I was born again, it was in the CNEC church. Later, I floated to the Baptist church because my friends were there. And then later, I went to the Baptist seminary and, and then for, visited many, many types of churches and ministered in Anglican churches, Methodist churches, different types of churches, even with their own structure. And, uh, the, and so sometimes as a young Christian or, or older Christian, you've been to at least two, three churches, uh, and you wonder, what is the ideal church? Where should we go? The place, first of all, settle the question of where you should be. Wherever church you go, wherever you, wherever you do, make sure it's a place you can grow spiritually. That's the most important. And uh, I understand that sometimes people find that they can grow because they are quite new in a church that is focused purely on evangelism with very little teaching. But once they outgrow that church, then they start becoming dry too. Then they say, hey, I want to grow some more. So they need to find another place and another place until they keep growing and growing in the Lord. So it's important to know that each one has a place and each one has time. And I believe God has all kinds of churches to meet to all kinds of needs. And uh, most important for the individual is to be able to grow. And um, then, uh, that is, to grow, you need to be able to receive. So you're in a church, uh, you either go there to receive spiritually so you can grow. And then sometimes you outgrow the church or you grow to the level that the spirituality is there. Then you can give to the people around you. So instead of uh, growing, you help the other people around you grow. So you go to the church to, to, to receive. You go to the church to give, to help others to grow. And the best is you can both grow and you can both give. And then that continues and continues until you meet Jesus Christ. So if you're in a church, a local church, and you're not receiving, nor are you giving, we have one question for you. Why are you there? <laughs> oh, it's by force or habit. Ah, yes. <laughs> and uh, if I had not made the decision to leave the Baptist church long ago, uh, I left the Baptist church uh, when I was a student pastor and... Uh, and the uh, chairman was also charismatic. He came to speak in Dan Sui, so in the peak of the charismatic revival. And uh, you know, in all Baptist churches, everyone has one word. And we every, always have a monthly uh, AGM meeting, uh, a monthly general meeting, and a yearly annual general meeting. All decisions are made with the AGM. And I remember because the charismatic meeting, charismatic revival was new, our church was touched. Some are speaking in tongues, some are again speaking in tongues. So, a decision was going to be made in that ch meeting and it says <coughs> we're going to decide whether we allow speaking in tongues or not and so it was a big major decision in the church uh, Baptist church is going to turn charismatic and so uh, wow you could see everybody gathering all their votes before the meeting everyone you vote for me uh, vote for this wow a decision based on votes and uh, I was a bit uh, you know uh, disheartened to see this kind of thing happening but then I uh, held on and then in the end, the meeting came, and the decision was, um, we will allow both charismatic and anti-charismatic to be preached in the church. I was, a, I was the pastor that said, well, how, how do I go? On Sunday, I preach, then, and the next day, somebody can preach against me, against the charismatic. I might say, tongues is of God. Then the next Sunday, someone will say, tongues is of the devil. I say, wow, how can? And... Uh, and uh, for the chairman, he was very happy. He said, oh, well, at, least, at least we got a chance, you know. Uh, for me, I said, no, sorry, sorry, sir. I said, I can't. I can't be in a situation where you preach uh, this and then, then the other meeting, they'll contradict that. How are we are going to cause more problems? And so I made a decision to leave. I handed in my resina resignation letter, never turned back. Now, I still got a lot of friends in the Baptist church. I still got a lot of friends and uh, former uh, colleagues and, uh, and they're still friends there in, in, the, t in the various uh, denomination churches but I know one thing if I had not left today I would still be at the same spiritual level I wouldn't have explored wouldn't have grown in other things it was after we left then oh no for the first time we don't have a binding structure or, or any form and we could just explore the Bible then we explore various things that's why we experiment with a lot of things that I, I, I teach about we, we pray in tongues long say if tongues is good let's pray and see what happens and uh, that's where we learn to formulate different things then I realized that in the end we still need doctrine in the end we still need theology 
And all these things, you go back into the Word of God to research the Word of God to find all these uh, uh, places of what the Word say. So it's important to realize that uh, wherever we are, whatever we do, there is always a right place for you to be. A right place where God wants you to be. Even in, in, in us coming back to Singapore, uh, we could go to another country. Mind you, we have open doors in America, we have open doors in Canada, we have open doors in other parts of the world. Why are we back here? Because the Lord asked us to come back here. And the Lord specifically told me Singapore. So, okay, Singapore is fine. And um, so, so, one needs to find the right place and the right structure. And then you go and do whatever you want to do and do it faithfully. We don't expect overnight miracles, but we do believe in being patient and praying right through until revival comes. And uh, so it's important for us to find the right place. Right place for you might be a different country, right place might be a different place, a different church, or a different fellowship. It's important for us to grow out of those things. And, uh, and I always tell many pastors, uh, and we, we have run Bible schools before. We had a Bible school during our peak in Malaysia called Vision College. We had trained some students and gone, gone out. We also had a Vision College in Christ Church, which is a Bible school. We go there and train. And uh, we always train students and we tell them, look, don't worry about church growth. You just keep doing what God wants you to do. God will add to the church. The other thing we encourage pastors is that we say, look, no one needs to worry about where the sheep goes. Because the sheep belongs to a particular fellowship, they will find their way to the fellowship. And if, if God's perfect will for a person to be part of the church, then uh, they can go to a hundred places, they will still end up there. It just takes time. And uh, if not God's perfect will for a person to be in a particular church, you can try to keep them there wherever you want. They will still escape because <laughs> they belong somewhere else. And so, you know, every church should have what I call open door policy. And so people can go anywhere they want. You know, because especially in Singapore, a small place, and today transportation, every city is the same. Uh, people go here and go there. But in the end, people need to settle down. And settle in a place they can grow. And no pastors need to feel uh, threatened or insecure because when revival comes, every church will grow. Every church is open to the work of the Holy Spirit. Will benefit from revival. When the first great awakening came, and the second great awakening came, uh, it ministered to mainly England and America. Every place that was doing God's will grew. And then they examined in the 1960s when God poured out His Spirit in Indonesia, every church was there doing normal things also grew. Not just the main place where the revival broke out. It was like the whole atmosphere in the whole city was changed. And that's why in your, in, in over the past 15 years, I, I've noticed that in Singapore, it was a period of church growth. The every pastors that are doing right, even the denomination pastors today have grown to two, 3,000. Long ago when we started the ministry, ministry in Singapore in the 1960s, there was only one, me, one mega church, and uh, the rich mega church, and slowly more and more. And uh, it's like a different phase. But now, people are getting hungry again. Because people are finding church growth is not enough. Being big is not enough. Uh, having uh, thousands of members is not enough. Because people want to be deep also in God. People also want to be deep in God. They want to know that God works. They want to know that the gospel works in their life. They want to know the presence of God in their life. Plus, we do not have sufficient signs and wonders and healings and miracles in Singapore yet. Wouldn't it be nice if uh, God raised up a uh, 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 Catherine Kuhlman ministry and every week there's a miracle happening and people know, okay, you can still go to doctors but if they cannot cure you, all that you can still go to this place to perhaps the Lord will grant you a miracle over there. Wouldn't it be nice? I know there are some churches that are praying for healing today. I know they have started healing rooms and all those things. But um, we are still not there yet in terms of God's presence bringing signs, wonders and healings. And there's so much more we can. And uh, how shall we reach there? There's no shortcut. The Word of God and prayer. And we keep pumping away into that. You will hit the power line. And God will show, for, show Himself. He always does. He always does. And uh, the miracles and the things that God will do uh, in their life. God will pour out His Spirit upon your life. And you begin to take into dimensions that 
that you never dream about that God can do. So these are all the areas that we, we have touched on uh, in chapter 6. And then the other part of chapter, uh, chapter 7 to 12, the other half of it, is interesting. When you look at it very carefully, I was analyzing and looking through again and again. Then you realize that it's all about people. It's all about people. In chapter 7, now it's about Stephen, who was just appointed in chapter 6. And uh, then uh, chapter 8 and 9 is about Paul whose old name was called Saul and how he got converted and uh, chapter 10 was about Cornelius and uh, chapter 11 was reaction to going to Cornelius chapter 12 was King Herod and so the next uh, section of 6 chapters from 7 to 12 is about people now here's the question why are the people mentioned? remember this is Luke writing the, 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 the Gospel of Luke and the, and the Book of Acts. Why did Luke record these people? There would have been hundreds of stories he could select from. But he select these major stories and put it in. In the first six chapters, he talked about the work of God in the early church. In the church in Jerusalem, that is. But in the next six chapters, from 7 to 12, he mentioned people by name. And then he, he sort of showed these people. And so it's a different outline. It's a different section uh, uh, that we go into from chapter 7 to 12, which I have outlined for you for your ease. Uh, look at the next page on this one. And uh, <clears throat> praise God. Yeah, the next page on this one. Yes. And uh, so it's coming up. And uh, what we have is a contrast between. Uh, Stephen and Saul both are steep in Jewish ways and both go different directions so what, what we have here in chapter 7 to 12 they are all people and we can see there is a contrast that was happening there is a contrast between Stephen versus Paul his own name was Saul and uh, why are the two contrasted together because both are steep in Jewish customs. Both know the Old Testament, but both were at that time going different directions. Stephen was by that time a major leader in the church, appointed as a deacon. Saul was a persecutor against the church. Why did that happen? We're going to look and learn why they are so different. Brought up under the same Jewish, in fact, Paul had a greater advantage than Stephen. He got the best teacher, and yet they can be so different. Why? The good, big, good question. Then there's a contrast of Gentiles. Cornelius, whose story is mentioned in Acts chapter 10 and 11, versus Herod. Both are, both are part of the Roman Empire. Cornelius was a centurion. Centurion was quite high up. One of the major, major persons uh, in charge over uh, a whole group of uh, soldiers. Uh, a centurion would be like a, a, you know, a big man in the, in the army A big man in the Roman governing system And uh, Herod of course was a king He was appointed by the Roman Empire To govern in the area of uh, Judea And uh, so he's saying why, why is their reaction so different to the church and the gospel? One uh, Herod, I mean, he was responsible for actually killing James, the apostle. And uh, then Cornelius, without the church, was a godly man. And so there's a contrast between the two and the principles that make the two contrast. Because they both serve the Roman Empire. They both have money. They both have people under them. But yet one became a cruel person who was an anti-church guy the other became a good man who continued to be a blessing I believe to the church and then there's a contrast of ministries right in between all these stories there was Peter and, uh, and in Acts uh, chapter 12 it talks about Peter and Dorcas there is a, a contrast Peter was of course the leader of all the church at that time Jesus himself said, Peter, you know, strengthen your brethren. 
So Peter was recognized as the, as the uh, foremost of all the twelve apostles. And um, he was more or less looked upon as the, the head of the church, the senior pastor, if you can call it, of the Jerusalem church. And then you contrast with a humble little lady who we might never have heard of, heard of if she didn't die. But because she died, we heard about her ministry. And look, there's a contrast of ministry. Peter could preach. Peter could uh, share the word of God. But Dorcas, she couldn't preach. She couldn't teach. She did not even have healing miracles in her life. But God loved her ministry. So much that she was raised from the dead to continue it. Peter died, no one bothered to raise him from the dead. <laughs> and so there's a contrast of ministry just to show us I know the things that are important to God in the Bible. So uh, with that background in your mind that covers the outline from chapter 7 to 12, we're going to look at uh, one by one of these. Uh, what makes the difference between Stephen and Paul? And, uh, so as you look at that, both of them know the scriptures. Because when you look at the, uh, chapter 7, you can see that Stephen knows the Bible. He knew the story. I mean, look, chapter 7 is a sermon by Stephen. And he quoted from the Old Testament. And uh, in those days, they preached without notes. I mean, how would Stephen know that he's going to preach? No, he preached just, he shared just like that. Uh, 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 on the spot, when he's confronted by the Jews, he didn't say, hey, wait, I'm high priest, I consult my notes. <laughs> no. He just knew the history of the Jewish people by heart. And he stood up and uh, when the high priest asked him, uh, Are these things so? And he got up and started from Abraham in Mesopotamia. He preached until he covered Bible history up to the time where they are when uh, Jesus uh, uh, came forth and he even rebuked them in uh, chapter uh, 7 the ending of his preaching he covered to Solomon's time and then he covered to uh, how God has appointed Jesus today and then in verse 51 52 he rebuked them he said you stiff neck uncircumcised in hearts and ears you always receive the Holy Spirit as your fathers did so do you which of the prophets did your fathers not and when they heard these things in verse 34 54 they were cut to their heart Wow, and, and look at verse 54. They gnashed their teeth at him. That's an interesting new one. Uh, people oppose him, but they, their teeth go like animals. Coming against him like animals. Uh, one thing when I, when I read Sir, uh, Stephen's sermon, he, where is Peter's sermon? You analyze this sermon with the other recorded sermon in X3. This sermon got more content. I tell you, probably Stephen was a better teacher than, than Peter. And uh, Peter, you know, has his revelation, his doctrine, but yes, Stephen was solid. Every verse and every line there, he was saying something from the Old Testament. He was solid preaching uh, away. He really know his, his Bible. And uh, <clears throat> Paul, in contrast, also know the Bible. Paul knew the Bible, but whatever he knew of the Bible, did not convince him that Jesus was a Christ. In Acts chapter 8, Saul was the opposite. He was consenting to the death of Stephen, and at that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered to the regions uh, of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation for him. Stephen died. He was the first martyr, stoned to death. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So who was Paul? We know Paul from his background that uh, you look at Galatians chapter, chapter 1. It gives us a bit of the background of Paul. We contrast the two men. In Galatians chapter 1, 
As Paul writes his, his gospel, he also referred to his former conduct in verse 13 and 14. Galatians 1, verse 13 and 14. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it, which was correct, Acts 8 recorded it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So what's the difference between these two fellows? Stephen, who is steep in the word, and uh, it did not record that Stephen was, um, was a, <coughs> uh, a priest or anything. In fact, I tried to do research to see what his background was, but not much is known about him. But one thing we know, after Stephen and the seven deacons were appointed, and Stephen being the foremost one, a lot of priests came to know the Lord. Especially mentioned that in Acts chapter 6. A number of the priests became believers. Never mentioned in Acts 1 to 5, but only in chapter 6. So I would gather that Stephen could be like John. You remember John? He knew the high priest's people's house. And it was because of him that he and Peter can go in during Jesus' trial. Uh, it was because John knew the people there. Well, most likely, Stephen knew a lot of these priests and he was quite a Bible scholar himself. From his preaching, you know he's a Bible scholar. He, he knew his, his, the Jewish Bible. He, he knew Judaism. He was steep in, Jew, in Judaism. So here are two people. Stephen, who is steep in Judaism. Paul, not only steep, he was the best of the scholars. He was the best Jewish scholar. He said he excelled above his other people. He was top student in Judaism. Under the top teacher, Gamaliel. But why do these two people who study the same Bible become two separate, different individuals? That's for us to figure out the contrast telling us. Which tells us this. That in the end, the turning point was the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, no one can come to the Father. So next time, don't just send the tracts or send a Bible. Pray for the Holy Spirit. It is not the Bible or the tract that can convert people. The Holy Spirit and His angels working along would have to bring the people and give them understanding. Unless the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, you can read and read and read and you still cannot see. That is a big secret. It can be applied to every area of Christian life. I, don't, I definitely know that whatever understanding and I speak the way Paul would speak, I believe that God raised me up to be a fivefold teacher too, besides apostle. And I believe that the teaching that God gave comes straight from His throne because, uh, and is important for the body of Christ. Whether the body of Christ takes it now or takes it down the road, doesn't matter, but that teaching is important to come forth. But I recognize this. The teaching didn't come because I got high IQ. The teaching didn't come because my brain power is better than others. It didn't come because of that. Because I was in the seminary studying and I still couldn't understand a lot of things. I didn't understand sanctification, justification, predestination and all those stuff. I had the same mind, the same mind that can play chess blindfold. The same mind can remember things. But I still cannot see it. So it's not just brain power or all those things. So don't give me credit for that. It is because in 1979, when I came out from the Baptist Church, I wrote down a long prayer. I believe it's because of the prayer. And in the long prayer that I had, that was when I started confessing and learning confession, because God showed my spirit man. So I still have that one. In my old handwriting, my handwriting has changed through the years. In my old handwriting, at that time my handwriting was even more cursive than it is today. Today, my, only my D is curved, but the rest all, all, you know, is not so curved. Last time, everything was curved. And I could see, see my old handwriting. And uh, my wife would have seen that 
and my notes, she actually photocopy and start meditating the same thing. And, and in that meditation, I asked God, I specifically asked God to show me all the mysteries of the Word of God. You know, I took where, wherever the word mystery occur, mystery of this, mystery, I put all the God show me all these mysteries. And then I asked God to show me everything that is in the Bible, everything that is in the verse, everything. It did not come overnight immediately. But through praying and praying and praying, over the years as God started showing me things, I believe it's because the Holy Spirit opened it to me. Otherwise, I would be no different from a blind man. You can give me the best elephant. And if my movements were restricted and the elephant was reasonably big, and I could only touch the elephant's stomach or the elephant's tail, I would still tell you the elephant is like a wall or a rope. Because we're still blind. It is only when the Holy Spirit opens, then you can see. That's the secret. Not high IQ, not brain power. How do we know that? I believe people like Smith Wigglesworth, who is not so analytical. But have you read some of his preaching? I mean, he didn't read any book, write any books. The books that are, are written, Smith Wigglesworth, were recorded sermons that he preached. Written, uh, recorded by somebody else. And, and you read some of the revelation he has. And Wigglesworth was not an educated man. He was a plumber. And yet, he could speak about all the different gifts of the Spirit. He could relate the gifts of the Spirit to each different gift. And all the things that come from his mouth. Where did that wisdom come from? The Holy Spirit. As the Bible tells us that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that even, even in Paul's time, he said today, in his time in context, he says, the word is read, but the eyes are still blind in the synagogue. It is prayer and the Holy Spirit which gives hope to every single one of you. And so some of you say, wow, I want the same confession. I really give it to you. Meditation book one. <laughs> Inside it is all the prayers of Paul. I prayed, you know, when I read Kenneth Hagin pray one prayer, Ephesians, and, and God gave him revelation, I was a bit more hungry spiritually. I said, wow, if one prayer is so powerful, let me take all the prayers. And I literally took all the prayers and I pray and 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 God still got long because there's so many prayers, so God still got long time answering. Still. And when God reveals something to you, you know it. You could study for ten years, you might not get it yet. But when God reveals it to you in five minutes you can see it. All together. That's called revelation. Now, it still needs the Bible. Like I say, Stephen knew the Bible, Saul knew the Bible, experts in the Bible. What was the difference? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The day Paul got the Holy Spirit, his understanding changed. He suddenly wanted to preach, wanted to teach. But God stopped him. You know why? He still needs to digest all that he said experiencing and he could he didn't start preaching until after his arabian and the damascus episode where after three years three years later don't know what he did in arabia but we know he must have been quiet studying the word and then only later he came back into preaching he rearranged all his understanding of the word the same word looks different the same word looks different and that is the only way to study the Bible. You study the Bible with... The Bible is truth and you need the spirit of truth to unveil it. And it's important to let the Holy Spirit teach you the Bible. And I can tell you one teaching of the Holy Spirit, whether it's sent by the Holy Spirit or something can send an angel to actually share something on behalf of the Holy Spirit. What they share with you, I tell you, you could study for the next nine months. Because there's so much material that you've got to go back and search, search. The angel will just, the angels of the Holy Spirit will just say, these are, these are revelations. And then you've got a few scriptures. Then from those few scriptures, you know you've got to explore the whole Bible to see that it's consistent. So much material to study, to grow in the Word of God. And uh, 
and then uh, the difference between Stephen and uh, Saul not need the Holy Spirit experience now, it doesn't look like a good word but the Christian life is about experience I know because when I was in the Baptist church and I was not spirit filled yet I was anti-charismatic when, some, when I hear about people speaking in tongues my first re natural reaction was probably the devil now I didn't even look at the Bible didn't say anything it was just the, the first comment that came out and I would stick it being as, a, as, as the enemy and not open to it until I personally experience it experience is still necessary or you need the experience the same way like they say that an, an atheist is only an atheist until they are in danger and then they very fast convert to be believers of God when they start calling out to God for help or higher power or whatever or people who don't believe in healing why? because they don't see you know uh, they, they don't feel they need supernatural healing they think that all the society's technology and medicine is good enough until one day they hit a place where science cannot help them medicine cannot help them then they really begin to, to say hey I need a miracle now then only they begin to realize the Bible is a source of miracle and then they're open to the experience but until they're open to the experience they would never even think about this other areas here and uh, that also applies to uh, uh, believing God for a miraculous provision and uh, sometimes I hear you know uh, rich people say you know we, we don't need we don't need to practice all this you know exercise all this I say, yeah because you, you're already rich right the, the poor person needs it they need to learn you know that God can supply all their needs and, and, and all those things so wait till the poor person say it then and, and then the Lord provide pro right, then you realize that you need a miracle but then suddenly one day the rich person also hits a place where they also need they are close to bankruptcy then they say hey does God do miracles in, in prosperity yes he does because he does in all areas God can work and sometimes God doesn't work because we don't have a need we don't have a need and we don't need the experience we thought we are self-sufficient and so either the need for the experience but definitely with the experience that God gives it changes your whole thinking look at Paul an intellectual person like him do you think you could have persuaded him to accept Christ? I don't think so I don't think you could argue, argue Paul but in one stroke in Acts chapter 9 on his road to Damascus a flashing light shoom, knock him off either his donkey or horse and the voice says Saul, Saul why are you persecuting me? His next words were, Who are you, Lord? Lord! He's an intellectual man knocked down by an experience. And his first words, he called Jesus in verse 5, chapter 9. Who are you, Lord? And although Paul was an intellectual man, Paul was a Bible scholar. The thing that kept him going the rest of his life was not just the Bible knowledge. It was his experience. Because Paul, right towards the end of his life, two chapters from Acts 28, not the end of the recorded ministry, in Acts 26, Paul says on the King Agrippa, Acts 26, and uh, we give you whole chapter. <laughs> I'm just pulling your leg, Alfonso. Uh, Acts chapter 27, uh, chapter 26. He says here from in verse 19. After he shared from verse 12 to 18. 12 to 18. Now this is many, many, many decades later. 
He has completed three missionary journeys, planted many churches. Now on his fourth journey, he is caught in Jerusalem as a prisoner, many years in prison. And one king after another come to interview him. He's going to be taken to Rome where he appealed to. Paul still remember his first experience and said in verse 19, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So what kept Paul going? Was it his knowledge of the Bible? Was it Judaism? No. His experience. His experience. And a spiritual experience like that was what kept him going. And I can assure you, you know, we have, you know, David, the mission, and all these things, and ministries. In every ministry, no matter how successful they are today, or no matter where they are starting off from, whether they are big mega churches today, 30,000, 40,000, whatever, you do not know what happens behind closed doors in those people's minds and hearts. Every single pastor, every single missionary, every single minister would have experienced challenges such that at some point in their life, they might have been challenged to give up. Say, ah, throw in the towel. But in the end, what will keep a missionary doing a missionary's job? What will keep a, a, a church planter planting churches? What will keep evangelists still going? What will keep a prophet going? What will keep a teacher going? Is their heavenly vision, their experience. Because God told them to do this, and if you are among those who understand God, you will do it until God changes. Until God tells you something else. And you will not stop doing it until God tells you to stop. And Paul says he is not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So the second thing that we realize that Stephen was different from Saul until Saul got the same thing Stephen had was experience with God. When you experience God, gold and silver cannot buy that. And Christian life is made out of experience. Just like it is, it's a love relationship we have with God. It's a real relationship we have God, with Holy Spirit, and with all the angels of God. It, these are all relationships that we build. Except they are of the spiritual realm type. The same like in your marriage, or in your relationship, or your brother and sister relationship, or in your uh, uh, parent and child relationship, or in your friendship. What makes your friendship your friendship? What makes your family relationship your family relationship? Your experience. Your experience. And how close you are with your brothers or sisters, or how close you are with your friends, how close you are with your colleagues, how close you are with your, your, your husband or your wife, how close you are you between father and children, or, or mother and children, is the experiences you share together. The more experiences you have shared together, are of course more the positive kind. Because you've got a lot of negative ones, of course it will definitely affect your relationship. But, it is your experience together that is established the depth of the relationship. And all th this life is a relationship with God, is a relationship with the Holy Spirit, is a relationship with the angels of God that God sent to you, is a relationship with other Christians. All relationships that is built. And relationships are basically experiences experiences so the big difference between the two was experience when finally Paul got the experience he was a different guy totally changed he didn't go to Bible school just got knocked off his horse or donkey that was it changed his life and for three days he was blinded and when you're blind you depend on others he was helpless he must have thought through everything that he has done and that changed his whole entire outlook that was there. But there are many things that contrast things. Uh, I just pointed to some others, some of these points. But what makes Stephen such an effective 
person in the Lord. You know, you can tell, he was the first martyr. The only Christianity worth living is a Christianity you're willing to die for. The only Christianity worth living is a Christianity you're willing to die for. Stephen was willing to die for his faith. In the end, Saul became willing to die for his faith. Then he was a changed man. A lot of Christians are Christians only until inconvenience strike. That's not true Christianity. The Christianity that God gives us should be one where you're willing to give your entire life to. You're willing to pour all your resources in because you believe this is true and this is real. And that's the only one that can succeed. I know many people who try to start churches or try to do this ministry, do that ministry, and some of them got some principles. They try to use some principles. But you know, in the end, if God call you to do something, are you willing to pour your blood, sweat, tears, and life into that? If your answer is no, you will not succeed. Because only when a person is willing to die, because if you're willing to die for what God asks you to do, then you're willing to give up everything. Imagine that. When a person is willing to die for their, what they believe, you cannot stop a person anymore. I said kill a person. But if a person is not supposed to be killed yet because God doesn't like allow you to kill a person because God got a job for the person, it's obviously there's only one route that a person can have. Success in God. And the reason why the fallout rate of many Bible school students uh, many people go to Bible schools, they come out, they try to be ministers here and there. A lot of them come out, and why there's a lot of dropout from full-time ministry is this. This is the only reason they're not willing to die for what they believe. If you're willing to do what God tells you to do, even you got to eat grass for your food, drink water from some uh, spring somewhere you found on the ground, you cannot succeed. Because hardship might catch you and then you give up. Needs might catch up with you and then you give up. Inconvenience might catch you and then you give up. But if you knew that the Almighty God has called you and you love not your life as your own, but you are now bought with the precious blood of Jesus, you are willing to die for Jesus, it's a different type of Christianity. I mean, you can go to a mega church on a Sunday and then you ask a question. Now, I don't want you all to lie. You know, if you, and if we, if we say, all liars straight away, you know, drop down to hell and die. <laughs> no. But if you ask a church of 30,000 and say, how many of you are willing to die for Jesus? Honestly. Of course, generally, you might some of them like Peter. Remember when, 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 when Jesus said, all of you are going to gonna be scattered and run away. And Peter said, I will not, I will die for you. Well, the first opportunity he had, he denied Jesus three times. So sometimes people say not knowing what they But truly, from the heart, where honestly, if a person is willing to die for Jesus, Satan cannot stop them. No, okay, anything, especially when you hit the right thing that God asks you to do. That settles everything. Hardship cannot stop this person. Lack cannot stop this person. Nothing can stop. And that's the type of Christianity that is worth living. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could fellowship with, even if it's a small group of Christians, and all 50 of them got one thing in common, all willing to die for Jesus. Oh, it's a different Christianity. Then if you fellowship with 30,000 Christians and out of them, 0 0.0000000, what, what the number there? One, maybe out of them, two are willing to die for Jesus. Your fellowship is different. Very superficial. 
Some of them, some, some Christians have been so sloppy in their Christian life that just because they got a poor business deal, they lost some money, backslide. What kind of Christians are we teaching? What kind of Christians are we asking people to follow the Lord? Jesus said, put your hands on the plow and don't turn back. Or oh, some Christian, you know, uh, uh, some, some things might not work for their life. Maybe they have seen death, they have seen sickness. Can I tell you, if you pledge your life to Jesus, it's just like pledging, you know, to a relationship, a, a, a holy matrimony. You love your wife or husband in sickness and in death, correct? Well, if you can do that for your wedding, how come you accept Jesus Christ? You couldn't pledge in sickness, in health, but I believe in health. <laughs> but even if you somehow cannot get it, you will still serve God, you still love God. Wow, what kind of, what kind of commitment will we have? Powerful Christian. Powerful Christian. Of course we believe in the healing power of God and all those things. But what happened if Job had given up? If Job had given up in Job chapter 2, if Job had cursed God and died, there would have never been a book of Job. Or it might have been two chapters long and Job died. It would be like one of the sad books. Like Ecclesiastes, all his vanity, he died. Job, hang on! You think it's easy to hang on when your friends are saying bad things about you. Three of his friends all really give it to him. And, and reasoning with him, Wow, and, and he is having boils all over. So painful, he got to take a, pit, a, 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 a clay piece and just crap himself once in a while. And he got to scrap himself while defending himself with his friends. And he was so painful, so inconvenient. Look at Job, he had no one. His wife also told him, curse God and die. Well, his wife lived up to chapter 42, not bad. Why? Because he still got need more children, seven more children. And, uh, but his friends also telling him, hey, something wrong is wrong here, that's why you're sick and all those things. Here, hang on to God. Not easy. Because Job is a character that despite his, his imperfection, he held on right to the end. And guess what? He doubled everything. He doubled everything. Many people did not even lose as much as Job. Job literally, literally lost everything. Everything, including his sons and daughters. And he still trusted God. And think about it. That was the challenge between Job and uh, between God and the devil. Remember what the challenge of the devil was. Does Job serve you for nothing? The answer is yes. No, have you forgotten the first question in the book of Job? The, the devil is telling God, Job believed in you and serve you only because of the good things. That was the challenge. And God says, fine, take the challenge. I trust my my, my, my little child Job, he'll do well. Oh, poor Job really suffered because God loved him. Because God got confidence in him. Because God boasted about him. Because God said, have you considered my servant Job? How wonderful he is. Oh, all this wonderful thing. The devil said, ah, bluff one, ah, bluff one, ah, bluff one. But he scrapped through. Although he got a bit of self-righteousness, he scrapped through. He really was willing to serve God for nothing. And what did he get? Everything! Hallelujah! If you're willing to die for Jesus right now as a business, uh, it, 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 and God saying to the business world, you're the type of Christian that's willing to die for God and serve for God. Tell you, in the business world, God give you everything. In the ministry world, God give you everything. God give you everything. Why? Because He knows all these things uh, not what's going to distract you. Well, those are some of the points in uh, Stephen, and uh, we contrast Stephen and Paul. We better go to some of the other people, otherwise, you never get to cover them. Cornelius and Herod, why are they contrasted? It tells us a different contrast that out in the world, Cornelius didn't know God yet in Acts chapter 10, neither did Herod. 
So it tells you in Acts chapter 10, verses Acts chapter 12. And you can tell, because Acts chapter 10 started with Cornelius and talked about all the good things that happened in Cornelius. Acts chapter 12 started with King Herod, how he imprisoned the, uh, the apostles and then he got James killed. And then he ended with him dying. It tells us here, and they are a contrast of how people react to the church and to Christianity and to God. It tells us this, that no one can excuse themselves of whether they believe God or not believe God even before the gospel come to them. Everyone has a light of the gospel even before the gospel reach them. See, the Bible seems to put that very clear, which is why sometimes when God sent Paul to uh, Philippi or to Macedonia, instead of Bithynia and Mysia, the Holy Spirit knows every place has its time. In the book of Romans chapter 1, it tells us here, Romans chapter 1, verse uh, 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their hearts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So everyone has an opportunity to know God. No one is excused. And in John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1, it says here in verse 9, talking about Jesus, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So whether it be King Herod, whether it be a centurion, two examples of Gentiles, anyone out there in the world, it doesn't matter if the gospel has come to them because they are accountable to the light they receive, which is their conscience. You can become a seeker after God or a believer in God based even on what is already out there before Jesus comes into the picture. See, Cornelius was already a lover of God before Jesus came in. Herod, he was more rich, more powerful, more influential. He would have the same opportunity as Cornelius. But instead of responding well, he is judged by his actions. Remember, what we really believe becomes our actions. And so when, when Paul was persecuting the church, Jesus didn't say, so, so, why are you persecuting the church? Jesus didn't say that. Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Because whatever you do to the church, you're doing to me. Cornelius in his relationship with the church surely he's a centurion he was not a fresh face there he must have been a well-known centurion he must have heard about Jesus he must have heard about the church but was he a persecutor of the church? no in the worst case he would have been a neutral person in the best case he would have been friendly King Herod in his best case, he was a persecutor. His, his, his worst case, he's a murderer. So is God fair? Both got equal chance. Even if the gospel is not preached to you, what is your relationship to the people who claim to have the gospel? That is how God judges you by. So Cornelius, he was already a good man. It says in chapter 10, was one. A centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man who feared God and he gave alms generously to the people. He prayed to God always. This is before he came to know Jesus. So Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2 works. And John chapter 1, as I tell you, every man already has some light. That light might not be all of the gospel, but they have enough to believe in God or to choose to react accordingly. 
So if a person becomes evil based on whatever lie and becomes extremely evil, it is still their own choice. And if a person chooses to become a devout man like Cornelius, that was a fantastic choice. And what does the Bible show in the contrast? To one of them, God gave the Holy Spirit in equal measure to the apostles and the Jews. To the other, the angel came with a sword and killed him and he, the worms ate him up. What a contrast. One was rewarded. How the, He was so rewarded that look at all the th- good things happening. God sent an angel to him. And God said in verse 4 through the angel, Your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. And um, then God, the angel told him to send for Peter who is the head of the church. Not only that, Peter was prepared by the Holy Spirit in a vision. Look at all the things God did. All for Mr. Cornelius. So the Bible record this in the book of Acts to tell us, this is one sample. This is not the only man. This is how God will work. And we know in church history, there have been sometimes people who are devout in some of their religions, And they seek God and seek God and Jesus appeared to them. Angels appeared to them. Brought them to the Lord. Because the Bible is telling us, preach the gospel, but preach, be led by the Spirit. Because the same book of Acts tells you, you can only go where you're led by the Spirit. Paul tried to go to Bithynia. Holy Spirit says no. Misia says no. But God is telling you, don't worry about the people out there. Don't just go because, you know, they give statistics. You know, every minute, one person is dying. Every second, how many people are dying? Every, and then you go, oh, 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 I better go. Don't want that poor thing, poor thing. Go. God don't want you to go there because they're poor thing. Yes, they're poor things, poor souls. They need God. But God don't want you to go just because they're poor souls. You think there are not enough people in Misia to preach the gospel to or beaten in? There are. But God only wants you to go because His Holy Spirit tells you to go there. We still got to be led by the Spirit. We are not heroes. Holy Spirit is still the hero. We are only going because the Holy Spirit sent you there. We can only do what God asks us to do. And, you know, it's not like you can win the whole world. We can only do our little part. And it's comforting us, telling us that there, if there are people like that, the best case scenario and the worst case scenario. If people are bad, good, evil, they are already there because of the light they received, they did not respond well. And the things he does for Cornelius, it looks like he do for... Do, he, normal Christian might not even have that many. How many of you got an angel told you where to find Christ? And an angel told to send the senior pastor of the biggest church in town to preach the gospel just for you. And have the Holy Spirit prepare the, the senior pastor who normally is unwilling. <laughs> Should not be though. But he has to cross cultural barriers that makes him more unwilling. And the Holy Spirit has to appear to him and tell him, you better go. Before he was told to go, tell him, you better go. And when he was wondering about the vision of the clean and clean animal, the Holy Spirit said to Peter, Go. And then after they go, while that senior pastor Peter was preaching halfway, before he has a chance to finish, have the Holy Spirit fall down and revival break out. How many of us have that opportunity? This Gentile God Cornelius had that. And sometimes it could be that maybe, you know, remember how reluctant Peter was? You know how controversial it was for him to go to the Gentiles? Number one, he has a cross-personal conviction. 
He is a born and bred Jew. Any one of you who have not sat down with the Jews, you go to Jerusalem and, and look at what the Orthodox Jews do. They will not even sit on the same table with you. I know the, the normal Jews do, but the Orthodox one no, will not be. Why? Unclean. You eat pig, they don't eat pig. Already different. And they will not. Don't talk about the food. They won't even sit at the same table. And that was the way he was brought up. So personally, it was, it was terrible to go to the Gentiles. He, he probably haven't gone to a Gentile home. And then, on top of that, you have opposition watching you. In Acts 11, it tells you the story how difficult it was for Peter. When he came back after all those things, he was challenged. In Acts chapter 11, verse 2, the circumcision party, oh, this party is a different party altogether, comes and says, Why did you go to the Gentiles? <laughs> oh, oh. Senior pastor also got scolded by this circumcision party. So you imagine all these barriers that are across, how much God does for Cornelius? A lot. In fact, I suspect, if the Holy Spirit didn't come up, Peter would just preach and say goodbye, God bless you. <laughs> but before he could finish, the Holy Spirit fell on them and he says, well, now we've got to baptize them. <laughs> and he didn't say in a very eager way. He Look at the way he says here, in verse 47, Acts 10, 47. Can anyone stop them from being baptized? Look at the way he put it. Negative. When, if they were Jews, they say, you know, be baptized, repent, be baptized. The same way in Acts chapter 2. Remember, they say, what shall we do? He said, repent, be baptized. Well, he commanded them to be baptized. Now, because these fellows are Gentiles, he still commands say. Can anybody stop them from being baptized? Anybody? Anyone here? <laughs> He's definitely not eager, right? To baptize them. So the Holy Spirit has to go out of the way to bless these people. Which tells us, what is our job today? This is where the church is reaching to the Gentile age, the age of grace. It's telling us the most important thing. When you're going out, this story is telling us. Because we have to go out to all the world. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit must go ahead of you. The angels and honor must prepare the way. Try going out someplace before the Holy Spirit goes there. Now, with this story, you can understand Acts 16. When, when, when Paul went to Bithynia, the Holy Spirit said, don't go there. When he tried to go to Mysia, the Holy Spirit forbade him from going. Why? Because the Holy Spirit hasn't finished his work which tells us something more. It makes us even smaller. You and I, sometimes we think we are great people. can tell you, I'm sure the successful ministries here in town or the successful ministries in America have grown their ministries until their followers are, 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 are 5 million people or so. You might say, wow, how great we are. Is it how great thou are? How great we are? Let me tell you, none of them would have succeeded if but for the grace of God. Every senior pastor in your city today is a senior pastor of whether 30,000 20, is because of the grace of God. People try to say, oh, they're so good in this, they're so good. There will be another person who is as good in whatever they do. Same like me. We are all saved by the grace of God. We just happen to have the grace of God. That God gave you that patch of grass and a group of sheep. None of us can take credit. None of us can take credit. We need to understand, you can be the most talented, gifted person. But if God doesn't want you to do something, you can never succeed. But if God wants you to do something, it's also our responsibility to go along. We've got to do it. But what it means here is, 
No one can be a successful apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, missionary, or any area, or plant church, or do anything, if the Holy Spirit hasn't prepared a way and gone ahead. Now, if the Holy Spirit prepared a way, ha, huh, it's easier than easy. Now, I don't mean there's no blood, sweat, and tears. But you just go and everything happens. And especially sometimes if the way where you yourself are more reluctant than eager. I'm sure if you're the Jews, Peter would say eager. He's Gentile way, he's reluctant. He actually was a reluctant apostle when he went to them. But God went ahead and did all those things. And it's always God working ahead that we see the results. So there's a lot to learn in contrast. But then, it contrasts chapter 12, important for us. It tells us this. Don't worry when the worst of the worst happen. And that is Acts chapter 12. If the Gentiles turn against you, here in chapter 12 verse 2, he killed James, the brother of John. So the first apostle to die. The first martyr was Stephen. Now the first apostle to die was James, the brother of John. When he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also, but it was not Peter's time to die. And so you wonder, is God going to deal with these people who, who punish the church unjustly, who torture the church unjustly, who make life difficult for the church, who make all, whatever they are in the world. And it will always be when you go out. Wait patiently. God will deal when He deals. Shoot! That's it. And he shows us here, inherit the worst case, who purposely harass the church, and which is a warning to every Christian and non-Christian. You know, sometimes it's Christian persecute Christian. This is a warning for them too. The thing is, if Christian persecute Christians, the good Christian should not react. If Christian persecute you, don't react. God is the judge, not you. If non-Christians persecute you, don't react. God is also still the judge. The worst part of a non-Christian, King Herod. Persecute, kill the church. Best case, he would have been persecuted. Worst case, is murderer. He murders the people. And he seek to, to want to kill Peter too. That's why they kept him in prison. But the church was in prayer. And so this Herod thought, wow, now he's bigger and bigger shot, right? He killed the James and then all the Jews say, Yay! Wow, he big. He, he, he feels like he's grown bigger. And uh, in his own esteem, wow, now he's more accepted by people among the non christian Who are the Jews here? They're anti-church people, the same guys who crucified Jesus and anti-Jesus. And uh, then, in the end, when, uh, when he, he was in his palm in verse 21, Arrayed in royal apparel, sat on the throne, and uh, he really was in pomp and posture. And then when he spoke, all the people say, Wow, he's like a god, not a man. Immediately an angel struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. He died. <laughs> And uh, it shows that God will deal with opposition to the church. He did it twice now by chapter 12. He turned an opposition called Saul into a convert. And he turned the other opposition, Herod, into hell. But God was still behind him. The Holy Spirit moved on. And one needs to understand that that contrast was there that the church in the book of Acts was bringing forth. The last little contrast in chapter 12 between a big ministry we see here and uh, let me put chapter 12 up there, right? Okay. Uh, it should be here in Acts chapter 9. So I'm going to change it. X9, X9, both. Acts chapter 9. There was a certain disciple in verse 36. Jopa, X9. 
Tabitha, and which is translated Dorcas. She was a good woman, full of works and charitable deeds. So it happened, she became sick, and then she died. And when she died, Peter, who happened to be nearby, they called on him, and when he came, in verse 39, all the widows stood and showed all that Dorcas has done. And Peter, when he prayed, raised her up from the dead. What a contrast between the two. It tells us in this little story that contrasts the ministry of Peter, which is high and prominent. You see Peter there in Acts 1, you know, in giving instructions to everyone. Acts 2, preaching all the way. Acts 3, bringing healing to the lame man. And uh, then Acts 4, Acts 5, they continue. Acts 5, he brought, you know, a judgment upon Ananias and Sapphira. People were afraid. His shadow was healing people. Wow, what a contrast. Great man of God. Great senior pastor. Sometimes we, we, we all say, we all idolate as Christians. You know, Christians are hero worship. Wow, wow. We forgot that in God's eyes, the little things that are being done are as important. And here is a little woman called Tabitha and, uh, and uh, 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 translated as Dorcas. No signs and wonders, not famous at all. Uh, nobody will have known her except the people in the town that she is helping. And uh, when she died, Peter was led by the Spirit to pray for her. And you could imagine Dorcas, you know, uh, when she died, that she's enjoying heaven. Oh, wow, you know, she had done a lot of good things. Then all the widows there crying, oh, no, no more Dorcas, who's going to sew our clothes? Peter, can you sew clothes? Peter said, cannot. <laughs> you know, nobody sew clothes, oh, you know. And can you imagine when he was praying and, and Dorcas's body was down here, but her spirit would have been in Jesus? And then as Dorcas was dancing in heaven, then she feels something pulling her. <laughs> she said, Lord, what is that? And the Lord said, Sorry, my dear, I have to postpone your celebration here. You got more work down there. More clothes to sew. More ministry to care for people. He said, Lord, I enjoy it here. Yes. You know, why don't you send someone? Sorry, I got... I still got 11 apostles, 12 apostles. I got several prophets. I got uh, some upcoming evangelists. I got actually seven deacons now. And I got many other church leaders and home group. But I only got you as the sewing person for these widows. And so she went back all the way, got raised up from the dead so that her ministry of sewing can continue. Wow, so important. You know, today when you look at uh, all the churches, don't be deceived by the w websites or by Christian magazine that always give all the praise and all the credit to the top man. Don't be deceived by that. In God's sight, some of the unnamed people happening, the things behind the scene in the spirit could be as important, if not more important. More important. And even in today's church, I think, you know, we got a lot of gifted people, preacher, teach there, preacher, teach there, wow, pray for the sick, wow, cast out devil, wow, oh, some with loud voice, or whatever, but what you got there? But very few will go visitation, the poor where no one wants to go, or help a poor person. Or, or, or do things for, for that, that nobody wants to do that take care of another person and we think God don't have eyes to see God has remember in Matthew I believe it's around chapter 25 when he's, he talked when Jesus says in Matthew when Jesus says you know when in the judgment Jesus says you know oh you're a good guy you know I'll reward you. Say, Lord, when did we visit you? When did we... Jesus said, when you visit the sick, you visit the prison, you have all this, you're helping me. God is still watching. And there is this little widow. Now, did Dorcas do what she did for credit? No. 
Doctors didn't do this so that she can become famous. I mean, who can be famous helping the poor? In fact, uh, Mother Teresa, now everybody wants to be Mother Teresa. Oh, Mother Teresa. Oh. But before Mother Teresa started, nobody knew that helping the poor can make you famous. <laughs> now you got a lot of Mother Teresa's going out, you know. Want to be the second Mother Teresa, the third Mother Teresa, which is good. I mean, her life inspired many others to help people, you know, the, the poor people. It's good. But to God, it's very important. And this is God contrasting that whether the smallest or the biggest in the church, all through and everything else in between, which is a lot of us, you are important to God. Don't think you're not important to God. Even the small little thing that you think is, is not very important, if you do it to the Lord, it's very important to the Lord. It's precious to the Lord. And we need to teach that to Christians because sometimes Christians, they measure things very funny. I know, you know, in some churches, they measure performance. How many souls do you want for the Lord? And I don't know. I don't think doctors win many souls. All the people she helped was inside the church. Or, you know, oh, oh can, you, can you teach the Bible? You cannot teach the Bible. Ah, your quality is your gift lower. What is this? Oh, you know, there will be some people who can teach, some people who can't. Or, or you know, that uh, sometimes we, uh, we, we create a church system of hierarchy where we start giving stars to different gifts. So the more prominent a person, who are the more stars they have? Well, what kind of star system we have? Jesus got a different star system. In fact, he tells us if you received a lot of credit down here, your star system is upside down. On the other side, you go, hey, why nobody knows you? Oh, you already received your reward down there on earth. So it's important for us to realize that if you do whatever you do or son to the Lord, you already got the other example, Cornelius. How many people know about Cornelius? Maybe only the people he helped. I'm sure he continued his ministry. I, I cannot imagine what he will be doing after he got the Holy Spirit and Jesus. I guess he will be doing more now he became part of the church. But he didn't do it for recognition. He didn't do it to be famous, he, he, he just did it because he loved the Lord. Same with Dorcas here. So whatever gift that God has given to us, whether it be a deacon's gift, whether it be serving somebody uh, others, or maybe you are not good at sewing, you're a cake baker. Wow, you're so good. And then you say, what can I use my gift for? Wow, you bake anointed cakes. So you send anointed cakes, they eat and they got healed. Wow, we were more powerful. Of course, doctors, eh, they make the clothing, the person wear, who knows, you know, she get anointing, what they wear, they got healed. Wow, that's powerful. And then, you know, you, could, you could, might be ministered to so many people through your cakes, that one day, after you finish your ministry, 120, you thought you live a rich life, you reach heaven, and God says, sorry, my dear. Okay, God doesn't call you sorry, my dear, whatever. By an angel on behalf of God. <laughs> he says, sorry, my dear. There are not enough cake bakers. We got tons of apostles. In fact, you know, Bible school, they're about to graduate another 1,200. <laughs> but don't have enough cake makers. Can you go and bake your anointed cakes? Look, they're all crying down there. And they go, please. God say, okay, I'll give you 10 more years. You come back 120 years, 130 years. <laughs> or whatever. So, that story is to tell us, Acts 7 to church to tell us this, don't despise your gift. So sometimes we look at the person with five talents, wow, wow, wow. Then the person with one talent so shy, hide it. Worse off than before. Whatever talent God has given you, do it as unto the Lord. So this story in the book Acts, this 7 to 12 sort of balances up. To show that in God's sight, all of us are equal. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. We ask, O oh God, that you establish your work in our lives. And we thank you for the gifts, the talents, and the Holy Spirit. As we study the book of Acts, Lord, we recognize over and over again, it is your Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you for the gifts and talents we were born with, gifts and talents you give us when we were born again. But we know, Father, ultimately, whatever is done is was your grace and the privilege you give us.
to do what we need to do on earth. And whatever you have for each one of us, Lord, in small little ways as we serve you, we are important to you. You have shown us, Lord, that whether it be baking cake, making clothing, or bringing healing with the shadow of our body, it still needs the same Holy Spirit. It's your same Spirit in diverse ways, bringing love and gifts to each one of us. And through each one of us, blessing others. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen.